The long-awaited return of Walter and Jesse finally came to pass in episode 11, appropriately titled Breaking Bad. There were endless theories surrounding the duo's appearance and how it could fit in with Gene's story. I was skeptical myself, but the Breaking Bad flashbacks turned out to be quite clever. The question for last week's episode was, who is Gene? What aspects of Saul and Jimmy make him up? His return to the con game with Jeff shows us that he still identifies mainly with Saul. So with that in mind, the question for episode 11 is, can he change? Does he have the capacity to retire the Saul persona and become a better version of himself? The Breaking Bad era scenes help us consider that question in a unique way. Now on a purely Breaking Bad fan level, it was incredible to see relics from the mother's show, the blue folding chairs, the methylamine, and the RV. I'm not one for fan service, generally speaking. I think it poisons a lot of stories, but they did it right here. It would have been much less interesting if it didn't have thematic relevance, but it actually did, and I'll get to that shortly. The episode kicks off with Francesca, who apparently can't find an occupation that doesn't make her roll her eyes every five seconds. Hopefully that can be rectified eventually. Maybe Bill's transformation can inspire her. But she does make it to the payphone Saul told her to be at, which begins a series of interesting conversations. Putting Gene inside a telephone booth as he talks about his financial and social desperation is perfect visually speaking. He's boxed in completely. The feds are still looking for him, his assets are frozen, and none of his former fixers are available to help, including his most dangerous shooter, Danny aka Price, a massive loss. All he has left is Francesca. And just like how Walter would ask Ed to disappear to keep him company in the cabin, Gene is reluctant to get off the phone with his former receptionist. He asks about their former associates even though there's really nothing of relevance to discuss, and he takes a softer tone with her as well, at least when he wants to keep her on the phone. The isolation of Omaha is taking its toll. Most notably, of course, their conversation leads to Kim Wexler, who Francesca reveals gave her a call to check in. After she tells Gene that Kim asked about him, he's presented with a crossroads. He can move on and continue to bide his time at Cinnabon, or he can give Kim a call and hope it opens up some alternative path. He ends up picking the latter, which, if nothing else, is a sign that there's a part of Gene that's open to redemption. Unfortunately, the phone call does not go well, and Gene ends up smashing the phone booth like De Niro in Goodfellas. In Goodfellas, Jimmy is reacting to the death of his friend, but that is not the case here with our Jimmy. I suspect, and this is not a prediction, I'm retired, that the person on the other end of the line told him that Kim no longer works there, and Jimmy is pissed not only that he can't contact her, but also because he sees her as his only chance for change. With Kim gone completely, he's trapped in this life. The only other option I would consider is that he does talk to Kim, and she tells him to turn himself in. I don't believe this is the case, because I think his reaction in that scenario would be more somber than angry, but we will find the truth behind the phone call next week. Right after this painful moment for Gene, we follow him to Cinnabon and watch him flip his machine from off to on. As we know, Jimmy uses the Saul persona to bury personal trauma, so when he switches on the machine, it's sort of like he's switching on Saul mode. The remainder of the episode is dedicated to the new con he designs with Jeff and Buddy, and how it connects to the decisions he makes in Breaking Bad. So why does he go back to Jeff? Gene's change of heart is triggered by the phone call. Saul Goodman is a psychological drug that he uses to subdue a wide variety of injuries. The phone call to Kim is a deep cut, so naturally, the dosage must be extreme. That fact is nothing new. Last week's episode was all about why Gene continues to inhabit the Saul Goodman persona. For me, episode 11 shed a light on the self-destructive impulse that influenced Saul at times and is now influencing Gene. We're taken back to the night that Saul was formally introduced to the two men that destroyed his empire of shells, and there are warning signs flashing all around these two guys. Saul is able to tell immediately that they're amateurs. And if you revisit that scene in Breaking Bad, Saul asks them why they don't just whack Badger, and is surprised that they haven't even considered the possibility. They're trying to infiltrate an industry run by some of the most brutal men on Earth, of course. Upon first analysis, you'd be insane to think they even have a 1% chance of success. And this is precisely what Mike tells Saul when he enters his office. Jesse is a meth head, and Walt is in over his head. To do business with Walt would be like buying a ticket for the Titanic. Saul is a smart guy and Walt is a big risk. Too big a risk to take on a hunch, that's for sure. But he rolls the dice nonetheless, confident in his own ability to control Walter. The way the camera moves in on Saul as he considers Walter and ignores Mike is very interesting. It's not a choice he makes in passing out of pure greed. Walter White is a project, a dangerous project, the type Saul gravitates toward to numb his pain. 
Just like Gus, Saul can't get control of Walter and things fall apart. But given Saul's soulless lifestyle, perhaps deep down that was a result he could stomach. This fateful choice is contrasted at the end of the episode by Gene's decision to return to the home of the man with cancer and rob him blind. Once again, this is not a risk he needs to take, as Buddy warns him. They've made a lot of money, why not just let this man go? But he can't do it, for a couple of reasons, I think. The decision to work with Walter and Jesse led to the death of Saul Goodman. Gene is his successor. I think there's a part of Gene that is hoping that breaking into the man's house will lead to the death of his new persona. There's also surely a part of him that wants to survive and keep the game going, but there's a spiritual darkness on display in episode 11 that feels different. You get the sense that Gene is beginning to digest how badly he's damaged his own soul, represented by numerous blank, empty expressions. And if prisoner death is the way out, so be it. Gene is overconfident because of his successful track record that comes into play as well, but I see a guy who's partly looking for an escape hatch. In this shot of Gene staring at the ceiling in the middle of the night, that's the darkness I'm talking about, very reminiscent of Walter doing the same thing. These are images of two men haunted by their past and unsure about their future. There's one more aspect of Gene's episode concluding decision worth discussing. His moral justification for robbing the dying man is, everyone has a sob story, just do the job and eventually you'll get over it. He's insistent that no moral boundaries be raised. This is another theme that traces back to Walter White. When Walt begins cooking, he tells himself, I'm doing this for my family. When I die, they need to be supported. But when he enters remission, he's very angry about it, because the possibility of survival tears down his moral excuse. Eventually, Walt adapts to this. Instead of using his terminal illness as an excuse, he just tears down all moral boundaries except for his family and decides that pure self-interest is an appropriate justification for evil behavior. Heisenberg could not survive without Walt making this transition. When Jimmy was a child, the con men who robbed his father taught him something similar. They taught him that there are wolves and sheep, and you must choose which one you want to be. That is the philosophy behind Saul Goodman. So to excuse this man because he's sick would be to crack that binary worldview. And he cannot allow that because he needs the opioid that is the Saul persona. So two parts of Gene are at war the potentially beneficial self-destructive side of him that wants to be caught so he can escape his life in purgatory, and the part of him that uses Saul Goodman as a crutch to get through the day. I'm hoping that Gene does fall apart, so Jimmy McGill has a chance to be rebuilt from the scattered pieces, perhaps with the assistance of Kim. The show doesn't appear to be headed in a fully redemptive direction, but I'd be surprised if we get a hopeless ending. There was a lot of imagery and dialogue in episode 11 about death, From the transition shot of Gene in the grave to the dying man talking about how there's a special place in hell for financial fraudsters like Madoff, a line that must have hit Gene pretty hard, you can imagine that as Gene stares at the ceiling, his mind wanders back to his brother and Howard and the role he played in their deaths. There are mountains of guilt on his shoulders, but it remains to be seen if any more people will perish during his half-hearted mission to destroy himself. Looking to next week, we will get scenes with Saul talking individually with Walter and Jesse. We've been told as much by Aaron Paul. I'm really looking forward to those scenes, given the parallels between Gene and Walter, and Jesse too. Jesse was consumed by guilt as well before finding peace during his escape from Albuquerque, so I could envision them having a conversation about that burden. If you want to see a video like this for next week's episode, which is titled Waterworks, directed by Vince Gilligan himself, make sure to subscribe on your way out. There will be a lot to talk about, I'm sure. Hopefully the return of Kim Wexler will be on the agenda. Given that she works or used to work for a sprinkler business, the title is suggestive, but we shall see. Thanks again for stopping by, guys. Have a fantastic rest of your day. I will talk to you soon.